Praise the Lord, everyone. This is Brother Holland Parrott. This is Saturday, December the 16th, the year 2000. And uh, we'd like to pick up our study in the great Word of God where we left off uh, last time. And uh, we have been studying the great patriarch Jacob. And we continued up to the point to where that uh, uh, he actually went through uh, his wrestling with the Lord God himself. 32nd chapter of the book of Genesis. And we're going to pick up there where we left off on the 33rd chapter. If you remember, we're going to give you a, sort of a quick outline here. We have studied the devising brother, which was Jacob, of course, when he uh, uh, got Esau to sell his birthright to him. Uh, the deceitful son, where he tricks his father into receiving the blessing. The dreaming pilgrim, where he had this dream uh, when he was going down to Laban's house at Bethel. He had a dream. Uh, Genesis 28, verse 10 through 22. The love struck suitor when he fell in love with Rachel and down by the well. Genesis 29. The frustrated family man. Uh, Genesis 29, 21 through 30, verse 24, where that he was deceived and given Leah, the oldest daughter of Laban, instead of Rachel, whom he loved. And he had to serve uh, and work for Ra uh, Laban for 14 years to get those two girls. Then he had all these children by the girls. Uh, Rachel had two children, which was Benjamin and uh, Joseph. And Leah had uh, six sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar and Zebulun, Bilhah, which was Rachel's handmaiden. She had Dan and Naphtali. And uh, Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, had Gad and Asher. And then, of course, Leah had uh, Jacob's only daughter, which was Dinah. Then he was the enterprising employee uh, where he, uh, he got uh, the uh, all the cows and the sheep or whatever that uh, with ring strikes, speckled and spotted and he got all those particular animals from Laban because of a dream that he had and that was in Genesis 30 verse 25 through 31 55 then he was the determined wrestler uh, Genesis 32 verse 1 through 33 verse 20 and of course we're going to get into him meeting Esau and the 400 men today and so forth he wrestles with God by the uh, brook Jabbok and then he's the enraged father in Genesis 34, verse 1 through 31. And uh, Genesis 35, 22. And then Genesis 38, verse 1 through 30. Um, so Simeon and Levi, of course, committed uh, murder because that uh, Shechem, the father, the son of Hamor, uh, actually committed adultery with Dinah, his sister, their sister. And so they went in there and told them that they would marry their daughters and their sons could marry their daughters also if they would be circumcised, all the male children. So they did. And while they were yet sore from their circumcision, Simeon and Levi went in and killed all of the male people. And then um, over the sin of adultery, he was enraged by that. Uh, Reuben came and slept with uh, Billa, which was his uh, father's concubine, Jacob's concubine. And then he did, wasn't pleased with that. And that's found in Genesis 35, 22. The sin of adultery by Judah. Uh, Judah, one of his other sons, commits adultery with his daughter-in-law. After he had three sons, two of them were killed. And then uh, the younger Shechem was supposed to be given to uh, Tamar, which was Judah's daughter-in-law. Then he found her beside the road after not giving Shechem to her to be her husband. I'm sorry. Um... Uh, I was trying to get the get the name right, but he came to pass when he dwelt in that land that Reuben lay with his father's concubine. Remember all that? We just studied that. But then Tamar becomes pregnant, and Sheila is his son. Uh, that uh, he promised to give to Tamar. But then he got grown and she didn't receive him. Then he got her pregnant because she put a veil over her face, etc. And she had two sons. 
and one of them was in the line of Christ. But this was the reason where Jacob to be called the enraged father because all these things happened to him. Then he was the obedient patriarch, and he's getting ready to go back to Bethel and uh, preparation for the trip. God instructs him to destroy all the household gods that uh, Rachel had taken from her father Laban's house. He builds an altar at Bethel and calls it El Bethel, the God of the house of God. And this is found in Genesis 35. Then a soaring saint, he loses Rachel in childbirth when she has Benjamin. And then he bears his father Isaac. And then he thinks that Joseph, his favorite son, is killed by a wild animal. And all this is in the life and outline of the great patriarch Jacob. But we will continue his life here in Genesis chapter 33 today. Uh, Jacob meets Esau and Jacob journeys to Shalem. And this is the uh, 33rd chapter of the book of Genesis. In the previous chapter, we saw the high point in the life of Jacob, which was his encounter with God. On that night, a man wrestled with him, and the man, not Jacob, did the wrestling. Jacob was not looking for another fight. He has Uncle Laban in the back of him and brother Esau ahead of him. And the last time he saw both of them, they were breathing out threatenings against him. This man, Jacob, is not in a position to take on someone else. He was the aggressor. He was, as we have seen, the pre-incarnate Christ. Jacob resisted him until uh, the touch of God crippled him. Then, recognizing at least who he was, Jacob clung to him until he blessed him. From this point on, we will begin to see a change in Jacob. As we follow his life in the chapters before us, we will think that we have met a new man. To tell the truth, he is a new man. Jacob meets Esau. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him four hundred men. And he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaidens. Genesis 33, verse 1. And uh, Jacob wants to uh, spare his family. So he separates them from the others. And he puts the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. And he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Genesis 33, verse 2 and 3. I would love to have a picture of Jacob meeting his brother Esau. I suppose that while he was a mile away from him, he started bowing. He is coming with his hat in his hand because uh, Esau has 400 men with him and Jacob doesn't know if he is coming as a friend or a foe. And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Genesis 33 verse 4. Well, they are twins. They are brothers. Let bygones be bygones. It looks as if God has certainly touched Esau's heart because he has sworn vengeance that he would kill Jacob before he left. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, who are those with thee? And he said, The children which God hath graciously given thy servant. Then the handmaidens came near, they and their children, and they bowed themselves. And Leah also with her children came near and bowed themselves. And after came Joseph near and Rachel, and they bowed themselves. Genesis 33, verse 5 through 7. Uh, Jacob instructs his brother, uh, his family, to his brother or introduce his brother, his family, to his brother. And he said, What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? And he said, These are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. Genesis 33, verse 8. Apparently Jacob believes for a moment that his uh, strategy of approaching his brother has worked, but it hasn't worked, and it wasn't really necessary. Listen to Esau, what a change. And Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep that which thou hast uh, unto thyself. Genesis 33, verse 9. And Esau is saying, You didn't need to send that to me. I have plenty already. And Jacob said, Nay, I pray thee, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at my hand. For therefore have I seen thy face, as though I had seen the face of God, and thou was pleased with me. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, because I have enough. And he urged him, and he took it. Genesis 33, verse 10 and 11. This is almost a humorous scene. Up to this time, each was trying to get something for the, from the other. This was especially true of Jacob. Now we find uh, Jacob in a new role altogether. He is insisting that his brother take a gift, and Esau says, you don't have to give it to me. I have enough. 
But Jacob insists that he accept it. Believe me, something has happened to Jacob. <laughs> he reminds me of Zacchaeus in the New Testament. When our Lord called him down and went with him to his house, something happened to Zacchaeus. He wasn't the same man that climbed up the tree. He said that he would no longer be the tax collector who had been stealing from the people and had been dishonest. He wanted to return not only anything that he had taken in a wrong way, but he wanted to restore it fourfold. What a change had taken place. You could certainly tell which house Jesus had visited. Certainly, there is a change that has taken place in Jacob. Before he had traded a bowl of stew to get a birthright, now he is willing to give flocks and herds to his brother for nothing. In fact, Jacob insists that he take them. Esau finally accepted the gift. In that day and in that land, if one refused to take a gift which was urged upon him, it was considered an insult. Therefore, Esau takes the gift. And he said, Let us take our journey and let us go, and I will go before thee. Genesis 33, 12. Esau is saying, Now, as you return to the land, let me go before you, show you the way, and be a protection for you. And he said unto him, My Lord knoweth that the children are tender, and the flocks and herds with young are with me. And if men would overdrive them one day, all the flocks will die. Genesis thirty-three thirteen. Jacob says, I am moving my family, and we have little ones. Also, we have young among the flocks and herds. We can't go very fast. You, of course with that army of 400 will probably want to move much faster so you go ahead let my lord i pray thee pass over before his servant and i will lead on softly according as the cattle that goeth before me and the children be able to endure until i come unto my lord and to see her genesis 33 14 jacob says i can't keep up with you brother esau i'll just have to set my own pace you go ahead and esau said let me now leave with these some of the folk that are with me. And he said, What needeth it? Let me find grace in the sight of my Lord. And Esau returned that day on his way unto Seir. Genesis 33, verse 15 and 16. Esau lived in southern Canaan and Seir, the land of Edom at this time. After their father's death, he moved to Mount Seir, which God subsequently gave to Esau for a possession. Deuteronomy chapter, 20, uh, chapter 2, verse 5. Jacob journeys to Shalem. And Jacob journeyed to Succoth, and built him a house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth. Uh, Genesis thirty-three seventeen. Now let us not pass by so quickly and easily here that we do not pay attention to what has happened. A great change has come over the man Jacob. You see, all that Jacob's clever scheming to present a gift to his brother Esau has just come to naught. God had prepared the heart of Laban not to harm Jacob, and God had prepared the heart of Esau to receive Jacob. Now he has peace on both fronts. Esau did not want the gift of Jacob because Esau himself had an abundance. When Jacob insisted, he took the gift out of courtesy. Both of these brothers seem to be generous and genuine in their reconciliation. We have no reason to doubt it. Since Esau is now prosperous, and since he attached no particular value to his birthright anyway, there is no reason why he should not be reconciled to his twin brother. Now the sunshine is beginning to fall on Jacob's life. Laban is appeased, and Esau is reconciled. God has arranged all of this for him. Had Jacob been left to his own um, cupidity and his own cleverness, he would have come to his death in a violent manner. Therefore, uh, before too long, Jacob is going to look back over his life, and when he does, he is going to see the hand of God in his life, and he is going to give God the glory. However, the evil that he has sown in is yet to bring forth a full harvest. Trouble is in the offering for him. Uh, it is therefore waiting for him. Esau rides off to see her, and we bid goodbye to him for the time being. He will be back, however, for the funeral of his father Isaac, as we will see in chapter 35. And Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Paden Aram and pitched his tent before the city, and he brought a parcel of ground where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. Genesis 33, verse 18 and 19. Jacob is sometimes criticized because he stopped here at Succoth and at Shalem and did not proceed on to Bethel. Actually, we ought not to accept expect too much of Jacob at this time. He's been crippled, and he's just learning to walk with his spiritual legs. And he erected there an altar and called it El Elohi Israel, uh, Genesis 33:20. 20. 
Jacob builds an altar here, just as his grandfather Abraham was accustomed to building altars wherever he went. The fine feature is that Jacob identifies his new name with the name of God. He calls it El Elohim Israel, which means God, the God of Israel. This indicates real growth in a man who is learning to walk. Let me put it like this. This man is on the way to Bethel, but he hasn't arrived there yet. First, he journeys to Succoth. In chapter 34, our theme is the uh, defilement of Dinah by Shechem, um, Hamor's son. Simeon and Levi slay the men of Shechem. Frankly, Jacob made a mistake by stopping in Shalem, where there is going to be a scandal at this time in the family of this man. Dinah, the daughter of Jacob by Leah, is defiled by Shechem, son of Hamor the Hivite. And then Simeon and Levi, Dinah's full brothers, avenged this act by slaying all the inhabitants of the city of Hamor. This cannot be justified, and it is a dark blot on the family of Jacob. It reveals the fact that Jacob did not get away too soon when he left his uncle Laban down in the land of Haran. We need to see that God was right in getting him away from this environment. There are two things that God spends a great deal of time with in Genesis. First of all, there is the heredity. God is very much concerned that a believer marry a believer and that a believer uh, not marry an unbeliever. That is important for the sake of heredity. The second thing of concern is the environment of the inv individual. We see this especially in the life of Jacob. He was has a big family. Not only were there 12 sons, but there were also daughters. We are given the record of only this one daughter because she features in this very sad chapter. There is something else for us to note that is important to the understanding of Genesis, and that is that there is trouble in the families. Have you noticed that? There was strife and trouble in the family of Abraham. There was strife and trouble in the family of Isaac. Esau was Isaac's favorite, and Rebekah was a favorite uh, Rebecca's favorite was her son Jacob, and that caused a great deal of trouble in the family. Now we will see that there is a great deal of trouble in the family of Jacob. Jacob stops and stays in Shalem for a while, and it is going to cause a great deal of sorrow to him. Very frankly, chapter 34 is a sad, sorbid chapter, and this must have been a heartbreak to old Jacob at this time. Jacob, or Israel, as we should call him, has built an altar, and he has now given a testimony to the living and true God. There is a change in his life, but it is a slow growth and development. That should be a lesson to us today. Don't expect that as a Christian you are going to become full-grown overnight. God adopts us as full grown sons into the family where we are able to understand divine truth because the Holy Ghost is our teacher, but our spiritual growth and our progress are very slow. We may learn truths in the Bible, but we will find that our lives, we are very much, very much like Simon Peter stumbling here and falling there. Thank God that Simon Peter kept getting up and brushing himself off, and there came a day when he had a very close walk with God. In fact, he walked to a cross even as our Lord did. You and I need to recognize that in our lives the growth is slow and therefore the growth is in others will also be slow. Sometimes parents of converted children expect too much of them. Let's not expect too much of other people, but let's also expect a great deal of ourselves. There are three chapters in the book of Genesis that are not pretty at all, and they all concern the children of Leah, the elder daughter of Laban, who was given to Jacob. I believe that it gives evidence of the fact that God does not approve of plural marriages. The very fact that it was forced on Jacob is to a certain extent did not make it right by any means. Jacob at least went along with it. We find this in this section that the children of Leah are involved in sin. She had four boys. Uh, in this chapter it is Simeon and Levi. In chapter 35 we come to another um, of the sons, Reuben, the firstborn. In chapter 38, he will be Judah. Every one of Leah's sons turned out rather badly, and there was flagrant sin in their lives. We have already noted that there was a great deal of strife in all these families, but now another element has entered in. There is soberness and shoddiness that has stepped into the family of Jacob that was not in the family of Abraham or of Isaac. They had a great deal of difficulty and many problems, but nothing like we see in Jacob's family. Again, God wanted to get this man Jacob and his family out from the home of Laban, out from the atmosphere, because the very atmosphere gave the background for these awful sins that are mentioned here. Dinah is defiled by Shechem. Jacob has stopped here at Shalem and has brought himself a nice piece 
of ground in the suburban area of town. He is attempting, as it were, to orient himself to the culture of that day. Well, it wasn't a good place, and God wants to separate this man from this area also. And believe me, after you read this chapter, you will come to the conclusion that God better separate him from it. And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Genesis 34.1 Dinah went visiting in the town of Shalem. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. Verse 2. Let me put it in the language of the news media today. He raped her. If, you, if they can say it in the print on the radio and television, we certainly, this poor preacher can say it. Sin needs to be spelled out. There was a time when sin was sin, but now they've taken the S off of it and you're in the N group if you are a sinner. But that's not the way God spells it. He still spells it S-I-N, and you will notice that I is right in the middle of the word. That's where all of us are. And his soul cleave, or clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. And Shechem spake unto his father Hamor, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. Genesis 34, verse 3 and 4. This very interesting thing that is that the boy of Shechem was apparently in love with the girl and ready to marry her. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace with, until they were come. And Ahimor, the father of Shechem, went out unto Jacob to commune with him. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it, and they, the men were grieved, and they were very wroth because he had wrought folly in Israel in lying with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. Genesis 34, verse 5 through 7. We certainly agree that it should not have been done, but it had been, and now the fellow wants to marry her. When Jacob heard it, he waited for his boys to come in, and they had a war council. I am of the opinion that Jacob probably would have not made as much of it as he did when uh, Hamor, the father of Shechem, came out to him. It is obvious that he wanted to get the girl for his son's wife. Jacob probably should have yielded to that because that was, shall I say, the best way out at the time. Certainly the way it was handled was not the best way by any means and God did not approve of it. So Jacob may have, according to this author here, made a mistake and so forth. And Hamar communed with them saying, The soul of my son Shechem longeth for your daughter. I pray you give her him to wife and make you marriages with us and give your daughters unto us and take our daughters unto you. Genesis 34 verse 8 and 9. Although intermarriage would have been wrong, it seems that Dinah should have been given to Shechem because that would have prevented a worse sin. This of course is hindsight and Monday morning quarterbacks are not always right. And you shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade you therein, and get you possessions therein. And Shechem said unto her father and unto her brethren, Let me find grace in your eyes, and what ye shall say unto me I will give. Ask me never so much dowry and gift, and I will give according as ye shall say unto me, but give me the damsel to wife. Uh, chapter 34, verse 10 and 11. All of this reveals that Jacob is going to have to move on. This is no place for him mixing with the people of this land. And the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor his father deceitfully and said, because he had defiled down of their sister, Genesis 34, 13. And I feel that Jacob should have certainly taken all the leadership in the family. First of all, he should have prevented his sons from deceiving Shechem and Hamor. And he said unto them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised, for that were a reproach unto us. Genesis thirty four fourteen. The thing that disturbs me about this incident is that the real approach, the sin of rape, is ignored, and they make the reproach on the basis of the rule which God had given them regarding intermarriage with the uncircumcised. But in this will we consent unto you, if you will be as we be, that every male of you be circumcised. Then will we give our daughters unto you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. But if ye will not hearken to us to be circumcised, then will we take our daughter, and we will be gone. Genesis 34, 
Genesis 34, 15 through 17. The thing that Jacob's son asked him to do is to go through the ritual of circumcision. This ought to be a warning today to a great deal of many people. I recall one couple who came to me for counseling and asked me to perform their marriage ceremony. I would not unite them in marriage because he was not a Christian, and she claimed that she would not marry him unless he became a Christian. I talked with him, and he said he would accept Christ. <laughs> we had the prayer, and then I asked him, What have you really done? I've never heard such hemming and hawing and beating around the bush as this boy did. Very frankly, I said right in front of him, Young lady, I'll not perform the ceremony. I don't think the young man is converted. Well, they felt that I was being very harsh, and they went down the street and got another preacher to perform the ceremony. And after they were married, she tried to get him to go to church, of course. He had a good reason for not coming to hear me preach because I'd been so cruel to him. But then she agreed to go to another church, and they went two or three times. Finally, he just said to her point blank, Really, I'm not a Christian. Just go to, to just go to, through the ceremony of joining the church, and even saying you trust Christ doesn't mean a thing. It doesn't, you know, doesn't mean that you're converted. you got to repent, be baptized in the water in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and got to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Speak with tongues as the Spirit of God gives utterance. Then you can say you're born of the water and of the Spirit. And until then, we are not converted. Praise God. There's nothing quite like it, nothing to compare to it in this world. When you receive the Holy Ghost, it does something for you. And didn't do anything for that boy because he didn't really repent. Mark Twain had the same experience. He was not a Christian, and he was in love with a very beautiful, wonderful Christian girl. She would not marry him until he became a Christian. He professed that he uh, was a Christian, and they started off their marriage that way. Well, Mark Twain became very famous, and he was entertained by many famous people in the world. And one day, when he came back to his home in Missouri, and she wanted to go to church, he said, Look, I can't keep up the front any longer. You can go on to church. I know now that I am not a Christian. May I say that made a very unhappy home and it has absolutely spoiled the life of this lovely Christian girl. Here the sons of Jacob are saying, if you'll go through the rite of circumcision, it will make everything all right. A great many people today think that if they join the church, nod your head, and are able to use the right vocabulary and quote the right verse, that means that they are Christian. My friend, that does not mean you are a Christian. You've got to have the Holy Ghost and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ to even uh, pretend that you're a Christian. And these preachers on the radio and on the TV that tell you that Baptism is not essential for salvation. They're liars and false prophets, and they'll burn in the lake of fire with the devil and his angels. And if anyone tells you that speaking in tongues is not of God and that you don't need to speak with tongues, then they're also of the devil, and they're liars and false prophets, and they'll burn in the lake of fire and brimstone for eternity with the devil and his angels. We need to take heed unto the doctrine when continuing them, for in doing so we shall both save ourselves and them that hear us. Paul said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that hath called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that would trouble you. There's preachers all over the television, all over the radio, that's troubling sincere people of God that's trying to find their way. They're troubling them with perverted words, uh, trying to take the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and pervert them and turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. And they're, they're trying to deceive people and lead many astray. But you need to beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. If they don't preach one God, that Jesus Christ is the actual Jehovah of the Old Testament, if they don't preach baptism in water in the name of Jesus Christ, not to please the preacher, but to get their sins washed away, and if they don't preach getting filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues, they're not true men of God. And you don't need to follow this false teaching. You need to obey the gospel. Because if you don't obey the gospel, you'll burn with the devil and his angels just like the rest of them. And we need to take heed to all this. And their words pleased Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. And the young man deferred not to do this thing because he had delight in Jacob's daughter and he was more honorable than all the house of his father. Genesis 34, 18 and 19. I agree that this boy is doing the honorable thing at this time. And Hamor and Shechem, his son, came and to the gate of their city, and commune with the men of their city, saying, These men are peaceable with us, therefore let them dwell in the land, and trade therein. For the land 
Behold, it is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us for wives, and let us give them our daughters. Only herein will the men consent unto us, for to dwell with us, to be one people. If every male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised, shall not their cattle and their substance and every beast of theirs be ours? Only let us consent unto them, and they will dwell with us. Genesis 34, verse 20 through 23. In other words, through intermarriage, these men expected to eventually own everything that Jacob had. And unto Hamor and unto Shechem his son hearkened all that went out of the gate of the city. And every male was circumcised all that went out of the gate of his city. Genesis 34, 24. Performing the rite of circumcision on unbelievers was as phony as it could be. It is like joining a church when someone is unconverted. Simeon and Levi slayed the men of Hamor. And it came to pass on the third day when they were sore that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each of man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. Genesis thirty four twenty five. And this was real trickery. Simeon and Levi were Dinah's full brothers and they wanted to get revenge. And their revenge they went too far. Neither the rape nor the fact that Hamor intended to dispose Jacob and his sons of the great wealth which Jacob had accumulated in Haran came can in any way justify the brutal act of Simeon and Levi, but it does reveal the impossible situation of dealing with the inhabitants of that land. The thing they have done is a very terrible thing. And they slew Hamor and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword, and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came unto the slain, upon the slain, and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. Genesis 34, verse 26 and 27. The other sons join in on this. This reveals greed in the family of Jacob that is not right and which they had learned in the home of Laban. They took their sheep and their oxen and their asses and that which was in the city and that which was in the field and all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives they took captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, Ye have troubled me to make me distinct among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And I, being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. Genesis 34, verse 28 through 30. Notice something that is obviously wrong here in the life of Jacob. Jacob rebukes Simeon and Levi for giving him a bad name, but he doesn't rebuke them for the sin which they had committed. We sometimes get a wrong perspective of sin in our actions. We think only of the effect that it is going to have. There are many men and women in our churches who will not take a stand on certain issues. Why? Well, the little crowd they run with may not accept them. They are with a little clique and they don't dare stand for anything that the little clique would not stand for. It is never a question of whether it is right or wrong. It is a question of whether it it, <laughs> it graduates them to the crowd. God have mercy on Christians who shape their lives by those who are around them and those who are constantly looking for the effect their conduct is going to have on others. They do not look on whether this is right the right thing or the Christian thing or whether as a child of God it is something that they should not do. This is the reason our churches are filled with those who compromise and it is a little wonder that we have so many frustrated unhappy Christians today. It is a wonderful thing to stand for the truth and when you stand for it then you don't have to compromise. How wonderful it is when we will do that. Poor old Jacob is growing but he hasn't grown that far. These boys of course attempt to, dis to defend themselves. You know, and I, I'd like to say this at this point, and uh, we haven't got to that point yet, but preachers in the world we live in today, in all types of circles, especially uh, the church world that doesn't believe this great one God message, they have turned their back upon dedication. They have compromised the truths of God's Word for the sake of keeping the crowd happy and keeping them coming to church under the pretense of uh, getting them uh, giving them plenty of space to repent and turn around and all that. But what they're really doing is they're afraid to preach truth because they're afraid they're going to run the crowd off. I've seen preachers preach hard enough to, uh, it, was just, it was so hard that you would think, well, he'd run everybody off. But God added to the church daily such as should be saved. If people don't want to live for God, you're compromised and you're turning away from God's truth
and slacking up on preaching is not going to keep them people saved because if they don't want to live for God and they don't want to obey the gospel anyway, all your compromise is going to do is send you to hell, if you're a preacher, that is. Glory to God. And they said, Shall he deal with our sister as with an harlot? Genesis 34, verse 31. That's a good question. I would say that if they wanted to take the judgment into their own hands, they first of all should have heard this boy out and let him marry their sister. It would have been the best thing to do under the circumstances, but it is not the right thing by any means. Certainly, that would have been much better to go on to the extreme of murdering these inhabitants of the land. There is no excuse that can be offered, and I have no defense to offer for them at all. They should have not done the thing that they did, but we must understand that they were not living in the light of Romans 12, verse 19 through 21. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. For a Christian today, Romans 12 is the policy that he should follow. The very uh, minute he will attempt to make revenge or to get revenge, it means that we are no longer walking by faith. We are saying that we cannot trust God to work it out. However, I am not sure that we could bring Jacob and certainly not his sons, up to such a spiritual level at that particular time. But you cannot justify their terrible deed which they have committed. You can well understand that they acted because of their feeling for the sister and the shame which had been brought upon the family. Jacob was beginning to see that a whole lot of chickens, not just a few, were coming home to roost. Genesis chapter 35, still dealing with Jacob. His, the theme of this chapter is that Jacob returns to Bethel. God renews the covenant. Rachel dies at the dies giving birth to Benjamin and then the death of Isaac all this is concluded in this chapter after the study in chapter 34 you may have come to the conclusion that I made a blunder when I said that Jacob's life changed at Peniel actually we did not see too much change in what took place in the 34th chapter this is quite true but there was a change that took place I hesitate to call Jacob's experience at Peniel a uh, crisis of experience uh, because I'm afraid that this is a matter of Christ's experience may have has been overdrawn by a great many. There are some people who feel that if you don't have a second experience, you just don't have anything. Well, there's only one experience, and real experience, and that is receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And you can repent, but that's not salvation. That's just the very beginning of salvation. And without the Holy Ghost, you're not filled with the... Uh, genuineness of what God wants and uh, what God considers the new birth. You must have the Holy Ghost speaking with tongues. You've got to be baptized in water in Jesus Christ's name for remission of sins or you're not born again. The fact of the matter, some have a wonderful crisis experience and I'm sure that many of us can turn back to that in our lives. But there are those who cannot or do not and have never mentioned it as being something very important in their lives. But when Jacob came to Peniel, a tremendous thing happened to him. All the way from the beginning of life and Jacob until Peniel, his life was characterized by the rise of self, the assert, assertion of flesh that Jacob, that's Jacob and nothing but that. What's really happened at Peniel was the fall of self. He went down like a deflated tire. He had been pumped up like a balloon and he went down to a practically nothing. But actually, chapter 34 evidences that he was not yet walking by faith as he ought to. As soon as Esau had turned his back and started home, Jacob took his family down to Shalem. It is a tragic move. Jacob was still depending upon his own cleverness. Dinah was raped, and Simeon and Levi, her full brothers, went into the city of Shalem to the prince who was responsible. Although he wanted to marry her, they murdered him. And the sons of Jacob conducted a slaughter that would make a gang shooting in Chicago look pretty tame. When they came home, Jacob said, You have made my name to smell among the people of my land. Many expositors say that it was a tragic thing for Jacob to stop and shake them. And I must say that I uh, to go along with that partially. But I have one question to ask. 
Was Jacob ready for Bethel? Was he ready for the experiences that God was going to give him? No. I think that the tragic things that took place in chapter 34 were the result of a man who had been walking in the energy of the flesh. There had been a deflation of self, but there was no discernible faith in God. Because he did not have faith to go on to Bethel, he stopped at Shalem. These tragic things which took place in his life revealed that this man was not a leader in his own family. He was not taking the proper place that he should have. He was no spiritual giant by any means, and to have those 11 boys to herd was really a job for which this man Jacob was not prepared. And after the tragic event, Jacob now is beginning to see the hand of God in his life, and now he makes the decision that he probably should have made beforehand. Jacob returns to Bethel. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Genesis 35, verse 1. Now God is calling this man back to Bethel. After this sad experience, he is prepared to go. You see, he didn't have faith to move out before, but Jacob now begins to take the spiritual leadership in his home. Then Jacob came unto his household and to all that were with him, put away the then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. Genesis 35, 2. Now, there are several things that Jacob tells his household to do. First of all, they are to put away the strange gods that are among you. We're almost shocked at this. You will recall that when Jacob fled from uh, with Rachel and Le Leah, Rachel slipped out with the family gods. Apparently she had sat on them while riding the camel. She just crawled on top of the luggage that was on the camel's back and sat down because these little images were underneath. Jacob did not know it at the time that she had taken them. He was very honest when he told Laban that the little images were not in his entourage at all. That may have been one of the few times he was truthful with Laban. He actually had not known they were there. When they were discovered, I think that we would all assume that Jacob would get rid of them because he knew of the living and true God. In fact, he had had a personal encounter with him. But he didn't get rid of the images, and now we find that his entire family is worshiping these strange gods. For the first time, Jacob is the one to take the spiritual leadership, and he says, let's get rid of these false gods, these strange gods. The first thing they have to do is to put away that which is wrong. There are too many people uh, who six days a week are serving some other god, and on Sunday they try to serve God. Many Christians, even fundamental believers, have their strange gods, and then they wonder why their service in the church on Sunday is not a thrilling experience. My friend, you're going to have to put away your strange gods. I don't know what yours might be. It could be covetousness. There are many a good fundamental businessman who is out after every dollar he can get. He gives more devotion to getting the dollar than he does to serving God on Sunday. And then he wonders what is wrong with his spiritual life. If you're going to come back to Bethel where you meet God at the beginning, then, my friend, you must put away those strange gods that are in your house. And Jacob says, be clean. For the believer, that means confession of sins. You have to deal with your sin in your life. You cannot come to church on Sunday and dismiss the way that you have lived during the week that has just passed. After all, you take a physical bath and use a deodorant before you go to church, and yet there is a spiritual body odor in our churches because there is no confession of the sin, no cleansing. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John 1 John 1.9 there must be the confession. He will forgive, but we must confess. And change your garments. In other words, get rid of those old garments. In Scripture, garments speak of habits. We speak of an uh, equestrian wearing a, a riding habit or a football player wearing a uniform, uh, which is his habit. In like manner, the child of God should dress in a way to mirror who he is and to whom he belongs. Do you wear the habits of the Lord? Can you be detected in business or in school or in the neighborhood as being a little different in your life? Well, you are wearing a habit. The day that Jacob went back to Bethel, he started living for God. Up to then, I don't think he was. Now, he says, let's go back to Bethel. That's the thing that we must do. 
And I like to say this, if you're in the Army, if you're in the Navy, or whatever type of branch of service that you're in, you wear the particular clothes of that branch of service. And if you're a Christian, the Bible tells us very plainly for young ladies to dress modestly, for uh, men to not have long hair, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and it is a shame for a man to have long hair. And if a woman have long hair, it's a glory unto her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. So we see in women wearing that which pertains unto a man. There's women that wear slacks that are so tight that you can see every part of their body. And that is an abomination in the sight of God. If you're a lady and you profess to be a Christian, you need to stop cutting your hair, and stop wearing jewelry, and stop wearing slack sets and, and things where it will show your body. You need to be an example unto the believers in conversation and lifestyle and charity and holiness and purity. And you don't need to be, be disobedient and try to show yourself in front of other men to try to get their attention. And if you're doing that, you're not really what you ought to be and you need to stop it. Now let us arise and go back, go up to Bethel and I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. Genesis 35 verse 3. Abraham and Isaac had made altars and now Jacob will make an altar. Thank God for that. He will now have a witness for God who answered me in the day of my distress. He was with me, uh, who was with me in the way which I went. The thing that Jacob remembers is that when he was running away from home as a young man, homesick and lonesome, he had come to Bethel and God had been faithful to him. God had said, I will be faithful to you. The years have gone by and God certainly had been faithful to him. Now, God says, you go got to go back to Bethel. You've got to go back to where you started. You've got to begin there. You need to recognize that the years we spend living a shoddy, shabby Christian life are a waste of time, absolutely a waste of time. God called the children of Israel to get out of Egypt and into the land of promise. God appears to them and told them to go into the land, but they didn't go in. Forty years they wandered around, and then God appeared to Joshua and said, go into the land. He picked up right where he had left off. They had wasted 40 years. How many people are wasting their lives as Christians? My, the tremendous spiritual lessons that are here for us. I don't know about you, but some of us are just like Jacob, and that's the reason this is so applicable to us today. Thank God that he says he is the God of Jacob. I love that. If he'll be the God of Jacob, He'll be the God of you and I also. And that's wonderful. This chapter is a great encouragement to us. Notice that Jacob is assuming authority in his home. And also, if you remember in the book of Revelation, Jesus told the church at Ephesus, he said, I, I know your poverty. I know the, the, uh, all the labor and all the things that you've done, all, all how that you've suffered for my namesake and labored and you haven't fainted. You know, and he was really giving the church at Ephesus a very great praise. And all of a sudden, he said, But I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. You know, and he said, Remember from whence therefore thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. If you don't do that, I will come and take your church out of his, out of his place. And the church of Ephesus disappeared, because they must, as a whole, not have returned to their first love. And if you and I today... If we compromise and grown cold over the years and I become lukewarm and not on fire for God anymore, we need to take inventory of our soul. The day is far spent and the night is at hand. Let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the whole armor of God and the, the armor of light. And let us look unto the hill from whence cometh our help, because our help cometh from the Lord. Let us look up and lift up our heads, for our redemption draweth nigh. Church, this is the year 2000, and it's almost 2001. And if there ever was a time, we need to get serious with Jesus Christ and make our calling and election sure. It is the day and the hour that we're living in. We don't need to play church anymore. We need to really be serious with God. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their land and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them out of the oak which was by Shechem. Genesis 35, 4. Let me pause to say that earrings were associated with the worship of the golden calf and all those things that they did. They were The earrings identified them as idolaters. And so they are going to get rid of them. 
they worshipped everything but God. Jacob hid them under the oak which was by them. The book of the New Testament, he said, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting of hair or wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be that uh, hidden man of the heart, even that what, uh, the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And, well, it's, it's all just self-explanatory. These old false prophets and false teachers on the TV and on the radio, building churches and running people and doing all these things and people flocking out to their old churches by the hands full. All they're doing is just leading a bunch of people to hell and people love to have it so. We need to really be strong. We need to preach the truth. We don't have to be ugly. We don't have to be so dogmatic that we have a wrong spirit. But you need it. You and I need to take inventory of this thing because this, this world is full of old false prophets and false teachers. And all they in this thing for is just to Ah, well, I really don't know exactly the reasons. If it's finances or popularity, I don't know. But be sure of this one thing. Your sin will find you out. And you need to get those earrings out of your ears if you're a woman. All that makeup and all that junk on you, you need to stop doing that. I know it may offend some of you, but I'm not angry. I'm, I'm just telling the honest facts. And if you get the real Holy Ghost, believe me, my friend, you'll stop all that junk. And if you're just sitting around going around the church and just doing all that, chopping your hair off, you women, and wearing breeches and shorts and all that old junk, and the preacher's not preaching against it, and you find you a preacher that will tell you <laughs> that it's all right. You can believe this one thing. You don't have the Holy Ghost. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were... Uh, that were around about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him. Genesis 35, verse 5 and 6. This place was called Luz before Jacob changed the name to Bethel. And the people in that day were knew that the people in that day knew it was as Luz, not as Bethel. We today know it as Bethel. And he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. Genesis 35, 7. Bethel meaning uh, the house of God was the name that Jacob had given it before. Now he calls it El Bethel, which means God of the house of God. This reveals spiritual growth in Jacob's life. But Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died and she was buried underneath Bethel under an oak, and the name of it was called Alan Bekoth. Genesis 35, verse 8. Now, since Deborah was with Jacob at this time, we assume that Rebekah had already died, and Scripture does not tell us when her death took place. Poor Jacob never saw his mother again. That part is not as tragic as the fact that she never saw him again. She had just sent him away for a little while, you know. The nurse apparently had brought a message to Rebekah, of Rebekah's death and had come to stay with Jacob and now she dies and God renews the covenant and God appeared unto Jacob again and when he came out of Paden Aram and blessed him Genesis 35 9 all those years God has been you trying to deal with Jacob now he picks up right where he had met him when he came to Bethel as a young man those years he spent down there with Uncle Laban in many ways were wasted years. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called him his name Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. Genesis 35, verse 10 and 11. I am Almighty God. Remember that that's what he told Abraham. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac to thee, I will give it. And to thy seed after thee will I give the land. Genesis chapter 35, verse uh, 12. And the Lord considers that pretty important property, by the way. This is now in, is the third time he has promised them the land. First to Abraham, then to Isaac, and now to Jacob. The Lord had to tell each one of these men about it two or three times, in fact. He told Abraham many times. And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. 
And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he taught with him, even a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him Bethel, Genesis chapter 35, verse 13 through 15. Glory to God. Here is the first mention of a drink offering. In the book of Levit Leviticus, five offerings are given, but not a drink offering. In fact, no instruction is given about it at all, but it is mentioned. Evidently, this is one of the oldest offerings, and it has a very wonderful meaning to the believer today. The drink offering was just poured on the other offerings, and it went up in the stream, or in the steam, rather. Paul told the Philipp Philippians that this is the way he wanted his life to be, just poured out like a drink offering. Rachel dies and at the birth of Benjamin. And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath, and Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. Genesis thirty five sixteen. Rachel had one son, a Joseph, but now she has a second son. And it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called the, his name Benoni, and, but his father called his him Benjamin, Genesis 35, verse 17 and 18. What a wonderful thing this is, not the death of Rachel, but the way this took place. She says, Call him son of my sorrow. But Jacob looked down at him and said, I've lost my lovely Rachel, and this little fellow looks like her, so I'll just call him Benjamin, son of my right hand. Jacob was partial to the sons of Rachel. Jacob loved Rachel. Uh, his love for her was perhaps the only fine thing in his life during those years in Peyton Aram when there was so much evidence of the flesh and of self-seeking. He loved Rachel, and there's no question about it. He was totally devoted to her. He was willing to do almost anything for her, such as permitting her to keep the images she had taken from her father. I don't think that Leah would have gotten by with it or anyone else, for the matter of fact. But he was indulgent with Rachel. She had given birth uh, to Joseph, and now she gives birth to Benjamin. And it was at the birth of their second son that she died. His life meant her death. It was a great heartbreak to Jacob. The other ten boys were no joy to him at all. God reminded him, I think, every day for 24 hours of the day that it was sinful to have more than one wife. He didn't need all of them. However, God will overrule, of course, and he overrules in your life and mine. You can thank him for that. But the fact revealed that God did not approve of this plural marriage. This is especially obvious in the treatment which Joseph received from his half-brothers. Jacob loved Joseph and Benjamin, and very frankly, the other boys were jealous of that. He should not have shown such partiality to Joseph because he had experienced the results of partiality in his own home. He had been the one whom his father had more or less pushed aside. He knew the trouble it had caused. Although I don't try to defend Jacob, we can sympathize with him. He had lost his lovely Rachel, but he had Benjamin. But while it was true that the boy was the son of Rachel's sorrow, Jacob could not call him Benoni. He was not the son of his sorrow. He was the son of his right hand, his walking stick, his staff, the one he would lean on in his old age. It is very important to recognize this because it will help us understand the great sorrow Jacob will go through later on. All of it will have its roots in Jacob's sin. God does not approve of the wrong in our lives, my friend. We think we can get by with it, but we will not get by with it any more than Jacob got by with it. And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. Genesis chapter 35, verse 19. She is buried there today. I have several pictures that I have taken of her tomb that is there. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave, that is, the pillar of Rachel's grave, unto this day. Genesis thirty-five twenty. That is, it was there until the time of Moses who wrote this, but it is also there to this very day. And Israel journeyed and spread his tent beyond the tower of Edar. Genesis thirty-five twenty-one. And then in Genesis chapter 35, starting at verse 22 through 26. And Israel journeyed and spread his tent beyond the tower of Edar. And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that 
Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve. The sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, and Levi, and Judah, and Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin. And the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, Dan and Naphtali, the sons of Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, Gad and Asher, these are the sons of Jacob, which were born to him in Paden Aram. Glory to God. And Jacob came unto Isaac, his father, unto Mamre, unto the city of Arba, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. And the days of Isaac were an hundred and fourscore years, and Isaac gave up the ghost and died and was gathered into his people, being old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. In verses 22 through 26, we have a listing of the sons of Jacob by his different wives. Actually, Joseph and Benjamin were the boys that were outstanding. The others just did not turn out well. Again, this proves the fact that God does not bless a plurality of wives. The family of Jacob ought to illustrate that fact to us. Although Uncle Laban was responsible, of course, Jacob went along with it. And of course, the death of Isaac. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died and was gathered into his people, being an old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Genesis thirty-five twenty-nine. I suspect that the death of their father Isaac was the only occasion which brought these two boys together in the years following Jacob's return to the land. Have you noticed that this chapter is made prominent by death? For there is the death of Deborah, the maid of Rebekah. In this there is the suggestions of the death of Rebekah herself. Then there is the death of lovely Rachel. And finally, the chapter closes with the death of Isaac. And now we will get into uh, chapter 36. Uh, Esau moves from Canaan to Mount Seir. That's the uh, theme of the chapter. Glory to God. This chapter deals entirely with the family of Esau, which became the nation of Edom. Although it may not be too interesting for the average reader, it is a marvelous study for one who wants to know and follow through on these names and the peoples who came from them. You will find that some of the names mentioned here are names that one hears out of that great Arabian desert today. Omar, the tent maker, belongs out there, as do Teman and Zepho and Kenaz and Korah. Well, here's a family of Esau, and they are still located out in that area. The family of Esau settled in Edom, but, uh, which is right south and east of the Dead Sea. It is a mountainous area, and the capital of Edom, the rock-hewn city of Petra, stands there today. Prophecy in the book of Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Obadiah concerning Edom has been remarkably fulfilled. The nation Edom came from Esau. Three times in this chapter it is made very clear that Esau is the father of Edom. In fact, uh, the names are synonymous. Notice verse 8, for example. Then what is the difference between Esau and Edom? Well, when we first met Esau, we saw him as a boy in the family of Isaac. He was the outdoor rugged type, a fine-looking athletic boy, by the way. Uh, outward, he, Lee, he looked attractive, but if there ever was a man of the flesh, Esau was that man. Years ago, a Christian girl talked to me about a fine-looking young man whom she had met. To tell the truth, they were both fine-looking young people. She had been born in China. Her father was in the oil business, and she had been made very wealthy. She met this young man who was a bank clerk, a very poor boy. I had been a bank clerk when I was a young fellow, and I knew that a lot of bank clerks look around for a good marriage. They notice the daughters of customers who have money in the bank, so this boy had met the girl. He was a handsome brute, fine-looking, the rugged type. To me, he looked like Esau. She was a lovely Christian girl who had been led to the Lord by a missionary while in China. She insisted on marrying this young man, hoping that she would, he would come to the Lord. I talked with him and knew that he had no notion of coming to God, but he wanted to marry that girl. She was a beautiful girl and had plenty of money, and uh, he was a man of the flesh. I told them I would not perform the ceremony. She was quite provoked with me, but later on she came back to to tell me that she was divorced. She told me she had never known a person so given over to the things that were secular and carnal and of the flesh. She said she never dreamed that there would be a person who would never in his entire life have a high 
noble, spiritual, wonderful thought. She said he was as crude as anyone could possibly be. On the surface, he gave a good impression, and he had been well-mannered and uh, chivalrous when they were courting, but underneath the facade, he was crude and rude. Well, that is Esau also. If you have been an attractive young lady in Esau's day and had been uh, seen him there in his family, the chances are that you would have been glad to date him. He was an attractive young man, but he was a man of the flesh. Perhaps someone will want to argue with God about this choice of Jacob over Esau. Esau looked so good on the outside. Could have God have made a mistake? Well, over in a little uh, prophecy in Obadiah, we see Esau unveil. One little Esau had become about 100,000 Edomites. Each one of them is a little Esau. Now take a look at the nation and you will see what came from Esau. It is like the putting Esau under a microscope. He is greatly enlarged. What do you see? We see the nation filled with pride. God said to Edom, The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Found in Obadiah chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. The pride of the heart was a declaration of independence, a soul that says it can live without God and does not have a need for God. That is Esau. In the last book of the Old Testament, God said, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. God never said that until over 1,000 years after these men died, but God knew the heart of Esau at the beginning, after they worked their way out of history. Out in history, it is obvious to us that God was accurate. Now, these are the generations of Esau. Genesis 36.1 Again, we are told that Esau is Edom. Esau uh, these are the generations of Esau who is Edom. Each Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and Ahalabama, the daughter of Ana, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite, and Bashamath, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Nebajoth. Genesis 36, verse 2 and 3. Glory to God. As you recall, uh, Esau, you recall, had married two Canaanite women and also an Ishmaelite woman. And the Bashamath, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Nebajoth, and Ada bare to Esau Eliphaz, and Bashamath bare Ruel, and Aholabama bare Jeish, and Jaelam, and Korah. These be the sons of Esau, which were born unto him in the land of Canaan. And Esau took his wives and his daughters and all the persons of his house and his cattle and all his beasts and all his substance which he had got in the land of Canaan and went into the country from the face of his brother Jacob. For their riches were more than they, they could, that they might dwell together in the land wherein they were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. Genesis 36 verse uh, 3 through 7. Remember that Abraham and Lot had the same problem. There was not enough grazing land for them. Each one had too many cattle. They had separated, and now Esau leaves the promised land, leaves it on his own due to economic circumstances. Then thus Esau dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. Genesis 36, 8. Now Esau moves from the land of Seir in Canaan, where he lived when Jacob returned from Paden Aram, Genesis 32, verse 3, to Mount Seir, which I have already described. And Tema was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's uh, son. And we're going to read this uh, down, that's down through verse 8. And then we're going to read through uh, verse 9 on down. And these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. This, these are the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, the son of Ada, the wife of Esau. Reuel, the son of Bashamoth, the, the wife of Esau. And uh, the sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepho, Gatim, and Kenaz. And Timna was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bare to Eliphaz, Amalek, and these were the sons of Ada, Esau's wives. And these are the sons of Ruel, Naamah, and Zerah, and Shema, and Mezah. These were the sons of Bashamath, 
Esau's wife, and these were the sons of Ahalabama, the daughter of Ana, daughter of Zibion, Esau's wife, and she bare to Esau Jeush and Jalem and Korah. And the dukes of Edom now are named. These be the dukes of the sons of Esau, sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn son of uh Firstborn son of Esau, Duke Teman, Duke Omar, Duke Zepho, Duke Kenaz, Duke Korah, Duke Gatam, Duke Amalek. These are the dukes that uh, came from came of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. And these were their sons of Ada. And these are the sons of Ruel, Esau's sons, Duke Nahath, Duke Zira, Duke Shema, Duke Mizza. These are the dukes that came out of rule in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Bashamath, Esau's wife. And these are the sons of Ahalabama, Esau's wife. Duke Jeush, Duke Jalem, Duke Korah. These were the dukes that came to Ahalabama, the daughter of Ana, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Esau, who is Edom. And these are their dukes, and the sons of Seir. These are the sons of Seir. The Horite who inhabited the land of Lotan and Shobal and Zibion and Ana and Dashan and Ezer and Dashan. These are the dukes of the Horites, the children of Seir in the land of Edom. And the children of Lotan were Horai and Heman and Lotan's, Lotan's sister was Timnah. And the children of Shobal were these, Ivan and Mahath and Evil and Shepho and Onam. And these are the children of Zibion, both Aja and Ana. This was that Anna that found the mules in the wilderness as he fed the asses of Zibion his father. And the children of Ana were these, Dahan and Halabama, and the daughter of Ana. And these are the children of Dashan, he, Hemdan, and Eshban, and Ithran, and Shiran. The children of Ezra are these, Bilhan, and Zeavan, and Achan, the children of Dashan, are these Uz and Aaron, and the dukes of Seir. These are the dukes that came of the Horas, Duke Lotan, Duke Shobal, Duke Zibion, Duke Ana, Duke Dashan, Duke Ezer, Duke Dashan. These are the dukes that came of Horai among the dukes in the land of Seir. And the kings of Edom, these are the kings that reigned in the land of Edom before they reigned in a king over the children of Israel. And Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was uh, Denhavah. And Bela died, and J Jobab, the son of Zerah, of Baal, reigned in his stead. And Jobab died, and Husham, of the land of the uh, Temani, reigned in his stead. And Hushan died, and Hadad, the son of Bedad, who smote Midian in the field of Moab, reigned in his stead. And the name of the city was Avath. And Hadad died, and Shamla of Masrika reigned in his stead. And Shamla died, and Saul of Rehoboth by the river reigned in his stead. And Saul died, and Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, reigned in his stead. And Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, died, and Hadar reigned in his stead. And the name of this his city was Peu, and his wife's name was uh, Mahedavil, the daughter of Metre, the daughter of. <laughs> Mezahab, the dukes of Edom. And these are the names of the dukes that came of Esau according to their families after their places by their names. Duke Timna, Duke Iva, Duke Jerath, Jetheth, Duke Ahalabama, Duke Elan, Duke Pinon, Duke Kenaz, Duke Teman, Duke Mizar, Mibzar, Duke May. Magadil, Duke Iram, these be the dukes of Edom according to their habitations in the land of their possessions. In the, he is Esau, the father of the Edomites. And this is chapter 36, uh, actually verse 12 through the end of the chapter, which is 30, uh, verse 39. And the Timni was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bare to Eliphaz, Amalek. These were the sons of Ada. 
Esau's wife. Genesis 36, 12. We're just commenting now on those chapters, on those verses, brother. This is the beginning of the Amalekites. Down through the centuries, those tribes which were there in the desert pushed out in many directions. Many of them pushed across North Africa. All of the Arab tribes came from Abraham through Hagar, the Egyptian, and through Keturah, whom he married after the death of Sarah. And there has been intermarriages between the tribes. They belong to the same family that Israelites belong to. In the Mideast, I met an Arab who expressed hostility to a statement I had made about the nation Israel in a message I had given to our tour, tour group. Although he was a Christian Arab, he told me how he hated the nation Israel. I said to him, but he is your brother. Believe me, that did not that did antagonize him. He said, I have no relationship with him at all. I insisted that he did. I said, you are both Semitic people and you are Semite as much as they are. Well, he had to admit that was true. So this chapter is important as it shows these relationships. The Spirit of God uses a great deal of printer's ink to tell us about this. We find some humor in this chapter too. These were the Dukes of Edom. And these were the Dukes of the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn son of Esau, Duke Teman, Duke Omar, Duke Zepho, and Duke Kenaz. Genesis thirty-six fifteen. Where in the world did they get these dukes, well, here's the beginning of nobility. They just assume these titles. Each one of them became a duke. It is not just a nickname. They mean business by it. The beginning of nobility is in the family of Esau. These are the sons of Esau, who is Edom, and these are their dukes, Genesis 36, 19. They have many dukes in the family now. A great many people in my country can trace their ancestry back to loyalty. It makes me wonder if anybody who came from Europe uh, were folk who worked in the vineyards, made pottery, and ran shoe shops. Everybody seems to have come from royalty. Well, Esau turned out quite a few of them. In fact, he went farther than, than producing dukes. And these are the kings that reigned in the land of Edom before they reigned any king over the land of, uh, over the children of Israel. Genesis 36, verse 31. There, this business of having kings was not God's plan for his people, but this was the lifestyle of Edom. They had dukes and kings over them. If you had belonged to the family of Esau, you would have needed a title because that is the type of folk they were. It is interesting to note that the people of Esau had kings long before the people of Israel had kings. In fact, later on, the people of Israel will say to Samuel, make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Genesis 8, I mean, 1 Samuel 8, verse 5. They could have said, our brothers down south, the Edomites have kings. We would like to have kings like they do. And these are the names of the dukes that came of Esau, according to their families, after their places by their names, Duke Timnath, Duke Alva, Duke Jehath, Jetheth, Duke Ahalabama, Duke Elad, Duke Pinon, Duke Kenaz, Duke Teman, Duke Mez Mibzar, Duke Magdiel, Magdiel, Duke Aram, Aram. These be the dukes of Edom according to their habitations in the land of their possession. He is Esau, the father of the Edomites. Genesis 36, verse 40 through 43. This is the family history of the rejected line. When the chapter gives a final resume, it lists again the dukes that came from the line of Esau. There must have been a lot of bowing and scraping to each other when you, they got together. I want you to meet my brother here. He is Duke Alva. And I want you to meet my friend. He is Duke Timna and the kings. I wouldn't, I doubt if you could even get in to see them. This is a very interesting chapter for anyone who is interested in the studying of anthropology or ethnology. After a chapter like this gives us a family history which probably extends farther back than any other source could go. So the chapter closes with a list of the dukes and mentions again that their habitation is in the land of their possession which is Edom. He is Esau, the father of the Edomites. We see the working out of this in the prophecies of Obadiah and in Malachi. This is quite remarkable, my friend, and something we cannot just pass by. Now we're going to get into chapter 37, and we're going to start dealing uh, with uh, Joseph's life. Glory to God. Joseph. Genesis chapter 37, and then uh, chapter 39 through 50. Joseph, he's the favored son in Genesis 37, 
He dreams dreams that a seed of his brothers, then the despair of his father. Chapter 39, he's the faithful steward. He has service, self-control, and sufferings. Genesis 40, the forgotten servant. He finds himself in the cell with Pharaoh's butler and baker. He interprets the dreams of the butler and the baker, and they all come true. But the butler forgets all about Joseph when he gets out of prison. The famed statement, uh, statesman in chapter 41 through chapter 44, and uh, the revelation of Joseph, the elevation of Joseph, and the frustration of Joseph's brothers. The forgiving saint, Genesis 45 through 48, Joseph and his brothers, Joseph and his father, and Joseph and his sons. And the fruitful shade tree in Genesis 49 and 50, he receives his father's blessing. Joseph is a fruitful bow. By a well, his branches run over the wall. His hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. And he shall bless him with the blessing of heaven above. In Genesis 49, verse 22 through 25, and he returns his father's body. And also... Joseph as a foreshadow of Jesus Christ. Note the amazing similarities between the two. They are beloved by their fathers, regarded themselves as shepherds, sent by their fathers to their brethren, or hated by their brethren without a cause, plotted against by their brethren. They were severely tempted, taken to Egypt, stripped of their clothes, sold for price of a slave, bound, remained silent and offered no defense, falsely accused, experienced God's presence through everything, respected by their jailers, placed between, uh, placed with two prisoners, one which was saved and the other was lost, uh, both around 30 years old at the beginning of their ministry, both highly exalted after their sufferings, both took non-Jewish brides, and both lost to their brethren for a while, both forgave and restored their brethren, they repented, and both visited and honored by all earthly nations. So it's going to be a very interesting study in the life of jo uh, Joseph. Oh, glory to God. Genesis 37 and 39 through 50. We see Joseph, he's going to dream dreams and um, so forth. Hallelujah. Chapter 37. The cause of strife in Jacob's family, the dreams of Joseph. Jacob sends Joseph to his brethren, and Joseph is sold into slavery. As we resume the story of the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we come to the fourth outstanding figure in the last section of Genesis. From here all the way through the book of Genesis, the central figure is Joseph, although there, we're still dealing with the family of Jacob. More chapters are devoted to Joseph than to Abraham or Isaac or to anyone else. More chapters are devoted to Joseph than the first whole period from uh, Genesis 1 through 11. This would cause the thoughtful student to pause and ask why Joseph would be given such prominence in Scripture. There are probably several reasons. One is that the life of Joseph is a good and honorable life. He is a living example of the verse, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Philippians 4 verse 8. God wants us to have whatever is good, virtuous, and great before us, and Joseph's life is just that. There is a second reason, and it is a great one, that there is no one in Scripture who is more Christ-like in his person and experiences than Joseph. Yet nowhere in the New Testament is Joseph given to us as a type of Christ. However, the parallel cannot be accidental. As we go into this story, we shall mention many of these parallels. There are at least 30, which I shall list later. Uh, so now we resume the story of the line of Jacob, which is that line leading to the Messiah, the Christ. Jacob is living in Canaan as the story of Joseph begins. The cause of strife in Jacob's family. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. Genesis 37, 1. Jacob has moved down apparently south of Bethlehem and has come to Hebron. This is the place where Abraham had made his home. This is the place of fellowship, of communion with God. Now these are the generations of Jacob 
Joseph, being seventeen years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and he, the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Genesis 37, 2. We can see that the bunch of boys Jacob had were real problem children with the exception of Joseph and Benjamin. It took these men a long time to learn the lessons which God would teach them. Now, notice that the emphasis shifts from Jacob to Joseph. Joseph was only 17, just a teenager, when this incident took place. He was the youngest of the boys out there with the flocks. Benjamin was still too young, you see, and was still at home. Joseph brought to his father a bad report about the other boys. Of course, they didn't like that, and I'm sure they called him a tattletale. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. Genesis 37, 3. Now, Jacob could have learned a lesson in his own home. He knew that to play favorites would cause trouble in the family. His own father had favored the elder brother, and Jacob knew what it was to be discriminated against. But here he practices the very same thing. We can understand his feelings, knowing that Rachel was the wife whom he really loved. She was the one fine thing in his life, and Joseph is really a fine boy, and Jacob loves him dearly. While all this is true, it is not an excuse. He should not have made him a, that coat of many colors. Another possible translation, the coat of many colors, would be the coat with sleeves, a long sleeve robe. You see, the ordinary robe in those days consisted of one piece of cloth about ten feet long. They would put a hole in the middle of it and stick the head through the hole. After the cloth would drop down the front of the body and half the cloth would drop down to the back of the body. They would tie it together around the waist or seam as uh, up the sides, and that would be their coat. They didn't have sleeves, so to put sleeves in the coat of any person would set him off from the others, and certainly a coat of many colors would set him apart also. And when his brethren saw that their father loved uh, him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Genesis 37, 4. Naturally, the brothers hated him for being the favorite of his father. They couldn't even speak peaceably to him. So here we see strife in this family also. I'll tell you, I don't care whose family it is. Sin will ruin it. Sin ruins lives and sin ruins families. Sin ruins communities and it ruins nations. This is a problem with our families and cities and nations today. There is just one cause. God calls it sin. So we... Uh, here we find that the boy Joseph is the object of discrimination. His father discriminates in his love for him. The brothers discriminate in their hatred against him. The dreams of Joseph. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. Genesis 37, verse 5 through 6. How can we explain his conduct here? Why would he go to his father and tattle on his brothers in the first place when he knew it would incur their hatred? Well, I think he just didn't know how bad this world can be. He had no idea how bad his brothers were. I'm of the opinion that he was a rather gullible boy at this time. It took him a long time for him to find out about the ways of the world, but he certainly did learn. Eventually, he probably knew as much about the world and the wickedness of man as any man uh, else knew. But that was later on. But now, you can just imagine how Joseph has been protected. His father centered all his affection to Rachel. He had fallen in love with her at first sight and had worked 14 years for her. Then many years went by before she bore him a child. And finally, jo Joseph was born. What a delight that must have been for Jacob. But now Rachel is gone, so he centers his affection on this boy. He shouldn't have done that. He was the other sons of Therese, too. But that is what he has done. Joseph has been loved and protected. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose. And also stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Genesis 37, verse 7 and 8. Can't you imagine how they sneered? I'm sure they were cynical. They didn't really believe that he would rule over them, yet they hated him because he had this dream. This doesn't end of the dreams, though, he had another one. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more 
and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me, and he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. Genesis 37, verse 9 through 11. He told them uh, this dream, and they understood what he was talking about. The same image appears in Revelation 12, verse 1, where the woman is described clothed with the sun, and the moon is under her feet, and she had a crown of twelve stars upon her head. That means the nation of Israel. These brethren understood that Joseph was telling them about themselves, the sons of Israel. We are seeing the nation of Israel at this it, it, its beginning here. Genesis is like a bud, and the flower opens up as we go through the scripture. Here is a bud that is not going to open up until we get to the book of Revelation. It is a late bloomer, but by the way, but it is going to open up here uh, in Genesis, I mean in Revelation 12. We need to understand what is being said rather than try to make guesses. We don't need to be guessing when it is made this clear. Old Jacob understood it exactly, and he chided. Does this mean that your father and your mother and your brothers are going to bow down to you? All Joseph could answer was, that was a dream. He didn't try to interpret it because it was evident. His brothers just dismissed it and paid no attention to it. They thought it wasn't even in the realm of possibility as far as they were concerned. They knew that not one of them would ever bow down to Joseph, but Jacob observed the saying. Jacob sends Joseph to his brother, and his father went to feed their father's and his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem, Genesis thirty-seven twelve. At this time, Jacob and his family were living around Hebron, which was twenty or more miles south of Jerusalem. And Shechem is that far north of Jerusalem, so that these boys are grazing the sheep a long way from home. You can see that they graze their sheep over that entire area. And all in Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said unto him, Here am I. Genesis thirty-seven thirteen. Joseph said, All right, I'll go. He was very obedient to his father, and you will notice. And he said unto him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it is well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent out uh, the vale of Hebron, sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. Uh, Genesis thirty-seven fourteen, And Joseph had traveled all the way from Hebron to Shechem. When he reached Shechem, he began to look around for them. That is rugged terrain up there, and this boy couldn't locate them. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? Genesis thirty-seven fifteen. I can imagine that this man had... Uh, seeing Joseph pass his tent several times, so he asked him who he was looking for, and he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. Genesis 37, verse 16 and 17. Dothan is a, very, is a long way north of Shechem. It is near the valley of Eshelon. And this is where the brothers have moved the sheep. And at last Joseph found them. There they were. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him. And we will see what will become of his dreams. Genesis 37, verse 18 and 19. How they hated Joseph. Here they are probably almost 100 miles from home, and they say to each other, Let's get rid of him now, and we'll see what will become of his dreams. Before we go out uh, on with the story, I want to call your attention to the comparison of Joseph to the Lord Jesus. You should not miss the analogy. The birth of Joseph was miraculous in that it was by the intervention of God as an answer to prayer. The Lord Jesus is virgin born. His, ver his birth was uh, certainly miraculous. Joseph was loved by his father. The Lord Jesus was loved by his father, who declared, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Joseph had the coat of many colors which set him apart. Christ has set apart 
uh, was set apart in that he was separate from sinners. Joseph announced that he was to rule over his brethren. The Lord Jesus presented himself as the Messiah. Just as they ridiculed Joseph's message, so they ridiculed Jesus. In fact, nailed uh, to his cross were the words, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Joseph was sent by his father to his brethren. Jesus was sent to his brethren. He came first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Joseph was hated by his brethren without a cause, and the Lord Jesus was hated by his brethren without a cause. Now, as we return to the story, now remember that Joseph is approaching his brothers, and we are, they are plotting against him. He is wearing the coat of many colors, or with the sleeves, which was a mark of position. We must remember that Joseph was younger than his brothers, yet was in a position above them. So there is all this hatred and jealousy to the point of murder. Reuben has already lost his position as the firstborn. However, he stands in a good light here. He has more mature judgment than the others. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. Genesis thirty-seven twenty-one. 21. Uh, they could have killed him right there and then if Reuben had not intervened. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into the this pit that is in the wilderness and lay no hand upon him that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to their father again Genesis thirty seven twenty two. it was Reuben's vowed purpose at, after Joseph had put, him, put in the pit to slip back again and take him out of the pit and take him home to his father and it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. Genesis thirty seven twenty three. That coat Joseph wore was like waving a red flag in front of a bull. They hated it because it set him apart from them. According to the law of uh, primogeniture, the older brothers had a uh, prior claim, so they stripped off Joseph's. Uh, they had stripped off from Joseph his hated coat, and they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. Genesis thirty-seven twenty-four through 25 This was a caravan of traders that was going by. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let us not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. Genesis 37, verse 26 and 27. Now Judah intervenes when he sees some traders going by. It is a very a mercenary plan that he has, but at least he doesn't want murder to take place. He doesn't want the blood of Joseph to be on their hands. The brothers were satisfied with the suggestion because what they wanted was to get rid of him. They didn't care how it was accomplished. They realized the Ishmaelites would take him down to Egypt and would sell him there as a slave. At least they would get, get rid of him. Slavery is most, in most places was a living death and they knew they would certainly never see him again or hear from him again. Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver and they brought Joseph into Egypt. Genesis 37, verse 28. At this point, you are probably thinking that Moses, who wrote the book Genesis Records, should make up his mind. First he calls them Ishmaelites, then Midianites, and then he calls them Ishmaelites again. So who are they? Is this an error in the Bible? Some time ago a student brought to me a little booklet which has been handed to him, listing a thousand or two thousand or so-called errors in the Bible. After looking it over, the only errors I found were in that little book, not in the Bible. One of the so-called errors was this matter of calling the men of the caravan Ishmaelites, then Midianites, then Ishmaelites again. This is an interesting point, and it deserves a closer look. First of all, it reveals how the critic and those who hate the Bible can interpret as an error something that actually shows the accuracy of the biblical record. Who are the Ishmaelites? They are the descendants of Ishmael, the son of Abraham. Who are the Midianites? They are the descendants of Midian, the son of Abraham. Ishmael was the son of Abraham by Hagar, and Midian was the son of Abraham by Keturah, whom he married after the death of Sarah. They are all brethren. They are actually akin to this group of boys who are selling their brother. At this time, who was an Israelite? Well, there were only 12 of them. How many Ishmaelites do you think there were, uh, might be at this time? Ishmael was older than Isaac, so maybe there were more 
or 100 or more. How many Midianites would there be? Well, Midian was born after Isaac, so there couldn't be too many, maybe a dozen or more. These were little groups, and in that day, travel was uh, dangerous. They were going across the desert to Egypt. They joined together in protection, and they joined together for a common interest. They were going on a business trip to Egypt, and since they were rejected, they understood or related rather they understood each other and joined together and may I say that the word of God makes good sense if you just let it make good sense we are the people that don't make good sense ourselves ignorance adds a great deal to what people consider contradictions in the Bible you can see that Moses understood what the situation was and he wrote precisely Joseph is sold into Egypt so the brothers sell Joseph to the Ishmaelites who take him down to Egypt. And Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit. And he rent his clothes, and he returned unto his brethren and said, this, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. Genesis 37, verse 29 through 31. Scripture does not tell us whether they told uh, Reuben that what they had actually done. But I'm sure that they did. And they probably said it was no use chasing after the merchants because they were a long way off and now, so might as well help them to think that uh, up a good story to tell Jacob. And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, This how we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. Genesis 37 32. Pretty clever, isn't it? They act as if they had never seen Joseph. They pretend they just found this coat. Believe me, they knew that hated coat, but they pretend they don't recognize it and ask their father whether he recognizes it. Jacob knew whose coat it was. He comes to a natural conclusion and, of course, the conclusion to which the brothers intended for it to come to him. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Jake, Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. Genesis 37, 33. Let's pause and take another look at this. They killed a kid of the goats and used that blood on the coat. Does this matter of, of deceiving a father with a coat remind us of something that we have heard before? Remember that when Rebekah and Jacob were conniving, they used a kid of uh, for the savory meat dish, and they took the skin of the goat and put it on the hands and arms of Jacob to deceive his father. Now the brothers of Joseph are using the blood of a goat to deceive their father who is none other than Jacob himself. They hand the coat to him and say, do you recognize it? We just found it up there in the mountains. It looks like a wild beast must have got hold of him. <laughs> Gold got hold of him. One old Jacob came to the conclusion that his son Joseph had been killed. Note this very carefully. Jacob is deceived in exactly the same way that he deceived his father. Be not deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Galatians 6, 7. Not something else, not something similar, but the same thing. This man, Jacob, did wrong and did some bad sowing. He used deception, and now that he is a father, he is deceived in the identical way that he had deceived his own father years before. When we sow corn, we reap corn. When we sow tares, we reap tares. We get exactly what we sow. This is true in any realm you wish to move in today. It is true in the spiritual realm, in the moral and in the spiritual realm, and then also the physical realm. This is also true for the believer. If you think you can get by with sin because you're a child of God, you have another thought coming. In fact, you'd better take that other thought and not commit sin because God is no respecter of persons. He said, this is the way it is going to be and you are not an exception. I talked to a minister who had gotten involved with another man's wife and I, as I talked with him, he tried to justify himself on the basis that he was someone special to the Lord. He felt that because he was who he was, he could operate on a little different plane and by a different rule book than anyone else. But he found that God is no respecter of persons. Notice of the grief of Jacob. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all the sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Genesis chapter 37, verse uh, 34 and 35. Perhaps some will think his grief is a demonstration of how 
much Jacob loved his son Joseph. I'll admit that he certainly loved this boy. It reveals that Jacob had not learned to walk by faith yet. He recalled the experience he had at Peniel. It was the deflation of his ego. The flesh collapsed there, but now he must learn to walk by faith. He hasn't learned that yet. In fact, the faith of Jacob is mentioned in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, but nothing in his life is mentioned there as an example of faith until the time of his death. Then faith is exhibited. Compare his brief his grief to that grief of a man like David in Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 15 through 23. David wept over the baby boy uh, of his who died. He loved that little boy just as much as Jacob loved Joseph. But David was a man of faith. He knew the little one couldn't come back to him, and he also knew that he was going to the little fellow someday. What faith? You see, Jacob is not walking by faith, friend. This is abnormal uh, grief. Christian friend, perhaps you have lost a loved one. Perhaps you can't get over it. I want to say to you kindly, not brutally, but kindly, learn to walk by faith. You manifest faith when you recognize that you can't bring that one back by grieving. It does no good at all. If you are a child of God and you are grieving over one who is a child of God, then walk by faith. You'll, you will see that one again and never be separated. The world has no faith. They grieve as those without hope. Christian friend, you can walk by faith. Now, the final verse of this chapter follows Joseph to Egypt. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt under Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard. Genesis 37, 36. We will leave Joseph right there and pick up his story in chapter 39. Now, where we get back to uh, one of the reapings of Jacob here and uh, with his son Judah. The sin of and the shame of Judah is the theme of chapter 38. This is another chapter that seems to be about as necessary as a fifth leg on a cow. After you have read the story, you may wish that it had been left out of the Bible. Many people have asked me why this chapter is in the Word of God. I agree that it is one of the worst chapters in the Bible, but it gives us some background on the tribe of Judah out of which the Lord Jesus came. The fact this fact makes it important that it is included in the biblical record. In this chapter, you will read names like Judah and Tamar and Pharaoh and Zerah. Uh, if you think they are sound similar, it is because you have read them in the first chapter of Matthew. They are in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, friend, that is an amazing thing. Our Lord came into a sinful line. He was made in all points like as we are, yet himself was without sin. He came into that human line where all of sin and comes short of the glory of God. This chapter deals with the sin and the shame of Judah. This leads me to say that the sons of Jacob were certainly not very much of a comfort to him. It looks as if all the sons were problem children with the exception of Joseph and Benjamin. And Joseph was no comfort because his father was broken hearted about his disappearance. All of this reveals to us that Jacob spent too much time in paid and Arab accumulating a fortune rather than teaching his children how different he was from Abraham. Now you remember that God said of Abraham, for I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. Genesis 18 verse 19. Well, Jacob didn't do that. He was so busy down there contending with Uncle Laban that he didn't have much time for his boys. That was tragic because each one of them seemed to have gotten involved in something that was very sinful. There is, I believe, a further reason for including this chapter in the Word of God at this juncture. Beginning with the next chapter, we go down to the land of Egypt with Joseph. God is sending Joseph ahead as he very clearly detected from the fruitious occurrence of circumstances in his life to prepare the way of the coming down of the children of Israel into Egypt. It would preserve their lives during the famine in Canaan, but more than that, it would get them out of the land of Canaan from the abominable Canaanites to the, the seclusion of the land of Goshen in Egypt. Had Jacob and his family continued on in Canaan, they would have dropped down to the level of the Canaanites. The chapter before us reveals the necessity of getting the family of Jacob away from the degrading influence of the Canaanites. This is the story of Judah, whose line will be the kingly line among the tribes of Israel. Uh, and it came to pass at that time that Judah, 
went down from his brethren and turned in to a certain Adullamite whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went in unto her. Genesis 38, 1 and 2. He went down to do business with a certain Adullamite, and when he got down there, he saw this Canaanite woman, and he had an affair with her. And she conceived and bare a son and called his name Ur. Genesis 38, verse 3. Uh, Judah called his name Ur, and certainly Judah uh, had erred. <laughs> he had sinned. And she conceived again and bare a son, and she called his name Onan. And she yet conceived again and bare a son and called his name Shelah. And he was at Chezeb when she bare him. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. Genesis 38, verse 4 through 6. This is the first appearance of Tamar. She gets into the genealogy of Christ this way. Now look at this family. It is just loaded with sin. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his, and it came to pass, when he went in unto his brother's wife, that he spilled it on the ground, uh, lest he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he had done displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. And this is Genesis 37, verse 7 through 10. This reminds us of the present hour when there is so much emphasis on sex. Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house, till Shelah my son be grown. For he said, Lest peradventure he die also, as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. Genesis thirty-eight eleven. And it was the custom of that day, when a man died, his brother was to marry his widow. Onan uh, refused to do it, and he was smitten with death. Now Judah has another son who is growing up, and he tells his daughter-in-law to follow the custom of returning to her father's house until the younger son is ready for marriage. And in proce process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died, and Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shearers to Timnath, he and his friend Hira the Adullamite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. Genesis 38 verse uh, 12 and 13. Apparently this deal that Judah had, which concealed or concerned, rather, seeing this Adullamite by the name of Hira was in connection with sheep. They were raising sheep and must have had a tremendous flock together. Judah goes up to, there to shear them. In the meantime, Tamar has been waiting all this while at home. She comes to the conclusion that Judah is not going to give her Sheila to her as her husband. And she put on put her widow's garments off her and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place which is by the way to Timnath for she saw that Sheila was grown and she was not given unto him to wife. Genesis thirty-eight fourteen. Sheila of course uh, was the third son of Judah. Tamar sees that Judah doesn't intend to give him to her as his wife, so she takes action. She takes off her widow's clothes and sits by the wayside with her face covered as was the custom of harlots. And he turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What wilt thou give me that thou mayest come in unto me? Genesis 38, uh, verse 16. Glory to God. Genesis 38. 15 says, When Judah saw her, he thought her to be in harlot because she had covered her face. And that's in verse 15. Now we get a picture of Judah. He has a proposition, his proposition, the Canaanite woman, she was daughter. Now he does the same thing with Tamar. This is a very black picture and an ugly story that we have here. Judah thought she was a harlot. She was, saw the opportunity of taking advantage of him, and she did it. And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, What wilt thou give me? Uh, wilt thou give me a pledge till thou send it? And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff that is in thine hand. And he gave it her and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. And she arose and went away and laid by her veil from her and put on the garments of her widowhood and Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend the Adullamite to receive his pledge from the woman's hand but he found her not Genesis 37 8 verse 17 through 20 now Judah sent his friend into the 
uh, town who said, I'm looking for the harlot that is here. Then he, the, then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot that was openly by the wayside? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said that there was no harlot in this place. And Judah said, let her take it to her, lest we be shamed. Behold, I sent this kid, and thou hast not found her. And it came to pass, about three months after that, it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth, and let her be burnt. Genesis 38, verse 21 through 24. That's Judah. Here is the old double standard. God doesn't approve of these things, friend. It is here in the Word of God, but it doesn't mean that he approves of it. Uh, his people are acting just like the Canaanites, which is the reason he is going to get them out of the land and take them down into the land of Egypt. There he is going to separate them and isolate them in the land of Goshen to get them away from this terrible influence. This episode reveals the necessity for God to do this. Judah is acting in a bad way that is unspeakable. It is so bad. The fact of the matter is he is quick to see the sin of someone else, but he can't see the sin in himself. It reminds us of the time Nathan went to David and told him the story about the fellow who had one little ewe lamb. When Nathan said the rich man came and took it away, David was quick to condemn the rich man. David reacted just like Judah does here. David said he wanted that rich man stoned to death. Then Nathan declared that David himself was the man. It is interesting that we can all see sin so cleverly and so clearly in other people. We can't see it within our own being. The charge against Judah is really a double one. His sin is terrible in itself, but it was with his own daughter-in-law. This is the way the Canaanites live. We think that there, we are in a sex revolution today, and there is a new sexual freedom. My friend, for centuries the heathen had have had sexual freedom. That's part of heathendom, and it is the reason they live as low as they did. It is the reason they were judged and removed from the scene. The Canaanites are gone. They are, have disappeared. God has judged them. They ought to be a message to any person. Yet a great many people don't see uh, and don't seem to get the message, even Christians. You wonder why this chapter is in the Bible. It is in the Bible as a warning to us. It is in the Bible to let us know that God did not approve of sin and explains why uh, God took Israel out of the land of Palestine and down into the land of Egypt. When Tamar then is then brought into the presence of her father-in-law, when she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are, am I with child? And she said, Discern, I pray thee, whose are these, the signet and bracelets and staff? Genesis thirty-eight twenty-five. 25. Judah was going to have her burnt, but she said, Well, I would like you to know whom the father of the child is. He is the one uh, who owns these articles that I'm showing you. And Judah looked down at them and had to admit they were his. And Judah acknowledged them and said, She hath been more righteous than I, because I gave her not to Sheila, my son, and he knew her again no more. Genesis 38, verse 26. This was repulsive even to Judah, but we can see how that he adopted some of the customs of the Canaanites. May I pause for a moment to make an application. Remember, all these things are written for our learning. They are examples unto us. Today we hear that if we are going to witness to this generation and if we are going to communicate to them, we've got to get down to their level. I disagree with that. God has never used that method to witness. God has always, under all circumstances, asked his people to live on a high and lofty plane. I can well imagine one of our present-day theologians going up to Noah and saying, Brother Noah, you're spending all your time working on this boat, and it is silly for you to be doing that. We're having a big party over here in Babylon tonight. They just got in a new shipment of marijuana, and we are really going to blow our minds. We're going to pass around the grass, and we're going to have a high time and take a little trip. You don't need to build that boat for a trip. We've got, <laughs> we'll give you a, a trip. Come on over. Noah, of course, would refuse. So the theologian would ask Noah, how do you expect to reach all the hippies in Babylon? How are you going to reach the Babylonian bee hoppers unless you're willing to come down and communicate with them? The fact of the matter is God never asked Noah to come down to communicate. God asked him, uh, gave him the message to build a boat. And this is what God 
asked of us in our day. I am firmly convinced that if God's people would give out his word and live lives that would commend the gospel, he would make their witness effective. There are many pastors in our day who are so afraid that they will lose their crowd if they do anything to attract people to their church and some of them are having their problems but God has never asked us to compromise God do, does ask us to give out the word of God regardless of the size of our congregation and this reminds us of the story of, about Dr. Schofield who was invited to speak over in North Carolina the first service was on a rainy night and very few people came to hear him speak the pastor felt that he must apologize to Dr. Schofield so he reached over and told him that he was sorry so few people had come to hear a man of his caliber Dr. Schofield replied to the pastor my lord had only 12 men to speak to and since he had only 12 men and never complained, who is C.I. Schofield that he should complain about a small crowd? Friend, this is a lesson for our generation to learn. We so often think that there must be crowds or else God is not in it. Maybe God has called us to witness to a few, but I have news for you. If you give out the word of God, it will have its effect. My friend, the word of God is powerful, and God is looking for clean vessels to whom he can give it out. Well, Judah had certainly lowered himself to the level of the Canaanites, and look at the results. And it came to pass in the time of her travail that, behold, twins were in her womb. And it came to pass when she travailed that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. And it came to pass, as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out, and she said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called Pharaz. Now, and afterward came out his brother, and he had that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was called Zerah. Genesis 38, verse 27 through 30. Now, if we turn over into the New Testament, we've will find the genealogy of the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. There we read, Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren, and Judas begat Pharez and Zerah of Thamar, and Pharez begat Eshram, and Eshram begat Aram. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. Then as we follow through the genealogy, we come to this verse, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ, Matthew 1, 16. It is an amazing thing that the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the flesh, should come through the line of Judah and Tamar. When we came to the human family, when he came into the human family, he came in a sinful line. He was made sin for us. He who knew no sin, he was made sin for us. He who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 and I'd like to give you a little bit of a uh, overview of that time will remain here um, in this particular chapter here the uh, sin of adultery committed by Judah uh, Jacob's name does not occur in this chapter and uh, we may assume that he was well aware of the tragic, uh, the tragic facts and disapproved of them. Judah's, uh, Jacob's fourth son, marries a Canaanite girl, and she bears him three sons, Ur, Ornan, and Shelah. And we just read that. And eldest son, Ur, marries a girl named Tamar. And, of course, she has uh, him as her husband. And then God kills him because he's wicked. And then he takes the second son and commands her to marry him to marry her. And then he spills a seed on the ground and God kills him for that also. And then poor Tamar waits around for uh, Judah to give her Sheila, his youngest son, to be her husband. And of course we see the story and we read it. A very beautiful, beautiful story in the word of God. And from that uh, lion came Jesus Christ. And as we will see later, if you will notice, Judah was one of the sons of the woman that Jacob loved the less, which was Leah. And Levi was one of her sons, which came the priesthood of, the, of Leah that he loved lesser than he did Rachel. And then Pharez, which was the, uh, son, one of the sons of Tamar here by Judah through incest or adultery. She was through the line of Christ and on in Joshua's day, Rahab the harlot married Salmon. And uh, this produced a little bitty boy, and 
he was in the direct line of Christ also. And then also, back up in Ruth's day, the Moabite girl Ruth married Boaz, and uh, which was of that same lineage through a harlot, through adultery. But uh, God's grace is farther than we could ever know. It's higher than the heavens. His wisdom and his judgments and his ways are past finding out. So until the next tape, which we will go into studying more about the life of Joseph, may the good Lord bless you in Jesus Christ's mighty name.